into that microphone. We want to hear you as loud as the two gentlemen on your right have been. Uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Isaacson, why do people come here illegally? I mean, why not just go through the system like apparently Ms. Wagner's relatives did and be right with the Lord and everything's hunky-dory? Why, why do people come here illegally? Well, I mean, for a few reasons, obviously. I mean, if you're coming illegally, which means you're not even asking for asylum, you just want to come here and start working, uh, that would be it. It's probably poverty, and it's likely that our laws from the 1990s have not changed um, to make uh, citizenship or residency or work permits more available to you. So one of the programs that was created to deal with the border situation was Remain in Mexico. Is that right? Apparently, yes. And if you're seeking asylum, which is a special category in immigration, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it and historically receives a certain respect, right? Certain protocols are triggered when someone appeals for asylum. Correct, and you should get due process. You're not just any immigrant, you're in a special category. So people who were subjected to remain in Mexico seeking asylum, what percentage of those people uh, were adjudicated in that program? Do you know? Uh, seeking asylum. Yeah, I mean, they were all asylum seekers. Uh, roughly half got to court, and only 2%, which is far less in the regular immigration courts, only 2% were able to get protection. Did you say 2%? Your approval rate was about 2%. Well, that doesn't sound successful. Uh, certainly not for the asylum seekers, it wasn't. Well, in whose administration did this Remain in Mexico program get started? It was uh, the middle of 2019, Donald Trump's administration. Oh, oh, We've got a failure on our hands in the Trump administration. Okay, well, let's pick one that was successful. If you remember in the 2016 campaign, that same individual who became president, uh, we recognize election results on this side of the aisle, uh, he <laughs> promised two things. We're going to build a wall, and who's going to pay for it? Mexico. Yeah, he would even get audiences to answer that question. So, how much of the wall, we got a 1,954 mile border, how much of the wall got built, do you know? Uh, all, all told, including replacements and others, Trump, I want to say about 600 miles of, of fencing. Hmm. And who paid for it? Uh, the United States taxpayer. Not Mexico? Not a peso. Another failure. Of which administration again? Remind me. <laughs> the Trump administration. Trump administration. Hmm. So, Mr. Wolf has said everything is on the table with respect to addressing the border. Do you hear him say that? Yes, and I saw the quote in the media. Now, we've actually had some Republican candidates running for president who have included in that category, at least for them, I don't know if Mr. Wolf would include it, and I'm not asking him because I have little time. Let's invade Mexico. We can do something about cartels. We can do something about crime. We can do something about illegal immigration crossing the border. Um, do you think that would be a wise policy to invade Mes Mexico? Absolutely not. not Why not? Well, I mean, first of all, it would go against the will of a sovereign country. But second, we've taken yeah, down but, cartels but for we want years and nothing We want everything on the table, changed. don't we? I mean, I guess that would be on the table always, but I don't know what purpose it would serve having that on the table. Hmm. What about what about putting kids in cages? <laughs> How about that? Uh, that has not proven to, be, to deter kids from coming, that's for sure, and of course it's cruel. So, but presumably, if we're going to have everything on the table, like we did in which administration were kids put in cages? <laughs> the Trump administration. Ah, another success story. Okay. But if we're going to do put everything on the table, should that be on no, the table? No, you're right. You're right, actually. Should that be on the table? Um, I do not think that would ever uh, be on the table. Detention of children should not be on the table. Why? We are not a country that sees itself as a country that, that puts kids in, in, in prisons. Ah. Kids should be in proper settings. So you're actually telling us that we've got values we should be honoring as we deal with any kind of situation on the border. It's what makes us a democratic nation. I thank you. I yield back. Uh, chairman recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connolly, I hope you stick around for a minute. Do, should I understand? 
Mass, I'm not here for your pleasure or enjoyment. I have, an, I have a schedule to keep. You rarely Thank you. offer me pleasure and enjoyment. I would agree well, with you. Well, and, and so, I assure you the feeling is mutual, Mr. Mass. This goes to you and Mr. Isaacson and your conversation just now. Should I understand from your questioning that any mile not built you consider a failure? Any mile of wall not built you consider would, a failure? Would you repeat the question? You want me to answer? Yeah, I'll be glad I, to. Would you? I, I, whenever I ask questions, I do always give you guys time to answer, so I'll, I'll ask it again. Uh, based upon the way I heard you asking questions, any mile of wall that was not built, would you consider that a failure? I consider the fact that a presidential candidate campaigned on the issue of I will build a wall that covers the entire border of the United States with Mexico, and the Mexicans will pay for it. I heard you talking. And he got rallies, and he got rallies to answer that. A mile that. of wall yes, not built. Yes, I consider a that an abject failure, and I consider it a, con a mile job, of wall not built as a. And failure? I consider it a con job on the American people. Do you think we should build every single mile of wall? Should we build every single mile of wall? I, I don't think it's practical, and I don't think it will work. I think it shows how little you know about physical security. Well, I don't think it's your business to be speculating on what I know and don't know, Mr. Mast. It's my business, physical security, being on why don't one you side stick, of a wall Why don't you another. stick to what you know as opposed to what I know? I can speak to what you know. I can speak to what it appears that you know. Well, we all can. you're good at throwing insults. I know you, I've seen it with Mr. Meeks. It's not an insult. It's a fact. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I thought... Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I thought I was being asked questions and of course and, and being able to answer. And does the gentleman uh, from Florida yes. yield to the gentleman from I, Virginia? I did, but I'm going to move back to the panel now. Oh. I, I thought it was interesting. I thought maybe it was a, a point of agreement that any mile of wall not yet built is a failure, that we should get to every single mile of wall being built because physical security does matter. Does it mean somebody's not going to try to jump it or burrow under it or cut through it or go around it in some, or some other kind of way? Sure, somebody's going to try to do that. But as somebody that's been on a wall in Afghanistan and other places, I can tell you that it certainly makes a, a damn good amount of difference that that wall is there. How tall it is, how, how, how much of an area it encompasses, you name it, it makes a huge amount of difference. And so I thought it you know, could have been a point of bipartisanness. Uh, Mr. Isaacson, I want to ask you a question. Uh, your testimony was interesting, and the testimony of everybody was interesting. You said this is not the border situation the U.S. government prepared for. Expand a little bit. Absolutely. Um, you know, in the 1990s and after 9-11, we built up a border infrastructure designed for Mexican males or potential terrorists. And now, two-thirds of who are coming are people asking for asylum and are often families and children. And I think the numbers bear that out. I don't think you're saying something that's, that's not true in there. And I think when we layer it upon things that, you know, the other, the other panelists have said, I think it works very well to say, okay, we have a situation that wasn't prepared for, but are we going to follow the law or are we not going to follow the law? Do words have meaning or do words not have meaning? Are, are we going to say that somebody is granted asylum because we're going to not define the word humane or inhumane and just say, well, if there was meanness in your country, then you're allowed in. Or if there was uh, poverty in your country, that constitutes a credible threat to life, so you're going to be allowed it. Or if there, you used the word the intimidation in, in earlier questioning, said there was intimidation. If there's intimidation, does that constitute a credible threat to life? And the, the fact of the matter is, the situation at the border is not what we prepared for because we're allowing people in under definitions that don't met, don't meet what we prepared for. We prepared for an actual credible threat to life. Mm -hmm. And we've moved to a situation where everybody that makes a complaint about their country and is unwilling to look at a different city in their country, a different territory in their country, an adjacent country to them, because they're unwilling to look at that, will say, well, it must have been a credible threat to life. And I'm going to give the last word to the other panelists here to just simply talk about what you see in terms of the, the lack of truly looking at the word of the law and the word of the law that we must follow as a United States government? Well, thank you for that important question. Uh, this Congress has the ability to change those laws. If it doesn't like the laws, if it doesn't like the grounds on which someone can be granted asylum, it can certainly change them if they want to. But doing so would be, would be a, I think, a, a serious uh, problem. 
uh, to cover all of those areas because we cannot become the place for everyone across the world to come to this one country. God made a wonderful world. It has a lot of great places across it. We cannot be the only place in the entire world where every single person who wants more money or better protection from crime comes to the United States to be saved. What I would say is that one of the other things that is critically important about this entire situation is that, factually speaking, right now at the border, these people, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of aliens crossing the border are not even being subjected or assessed for credible fear screenings. They're not even testing if these people have an asylum claim. They're just issuing court papers and letting them go. Out of, I think yesterday, there was something like 9,400 crossings at the border. And out of that 9,400, preliminary reporting indicates at least 5,200 of them were just given paperwork to go show up in court someday. This is a, a significant and serious problem. The administration is not even assessing these people for any potential asylum claims. They're just letting them. Gentlemen's time's expired. We have a uh, vote coming up in five minutes, and we have a lot of members. So in fairness, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to have to limit the members to two minutes, which, you know, I apologize. This has been a very great uh, to have a discussion, but I want to make sure I get in as many people as I can. Um, so the gentleman uh, from Mr. Keating is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Wolf, uh, American First Policy Institute.